Welcome to Churchville. The church of what's happening now is brought to you by my bookie, New. Holiday cash. You need it, and I know where to get it. My bookie is the place to score some serious cash on your sports predictions. Believe it or not, the holidays are around around the corner, and while that means plenty of parties, gifts, and spending, it also means there's a lot of football, basketball, hockey, bowl games, college basketball, and you can score big every day. There's nothing like waking up in the morning, blasting a bed in, and getting paid like a doctor. So what is what I'm telling you? Go to my bookie. Join now, and they'll match your deposit with up to a 50% bonus. You heard that right. A 50% bonus. Use promo code CHURCH to activate the offer. Visit mybookie.ag and use promo code CHURCH. You play, you win, and you get paid like a motherfucker. Now, for my honored people, if you're an honored customer, you know it's that time of the year. You rationed your MCT oil, outgrown your harpy kettlebell, and you're down to your last alpha brain. This is what I'm going to do. This Friday, the 24th at midnight, on it is turning on the Black Friday sale to 11. 25% off supplements, including alpha brain, 30% off apparel and gear. Holy shit. Head to onit.com, Black Friday, and sign up for alerts. To be one of the first to know and the first to shop. That's onit.com Black Friday to take advantage of the biggest deals. And it's also the time of the year where you fat fucks want to get in shape. You want to join jujitsu? Here you go. Go to fujisports.com and get yourself a nice A5 or A6. Get yourself for separito. And guess what? Put in church and I'm going to give you 10% off. It's that fucking easy. Kick that motherfucking mule, Lee. Are you fucking kidding me or what? That's Rick James slinging dick and banging white chicks three at a time up in Buffalo. You know what I'm saying? He'd made the temptations watch. They were too old. There's no Viagra. <laughs> Be real in the motherfucking house. He made, he made the temptations sang. Can you believe they Just sing, motherfuckers. I'm going to fuck these white hoes. You just yeah. sing and shit. And do a lot of coke. Could you imagine if he was alive, how many accusations would have been coming out? Yeah. He would have been in a cell right next to Harvey. <laughs> it seems that's happening with, you know, like people, like big wigs right now. You know, they haven't got like so many of the the artists that aren't as like popping as the ones they've been going after. Like, you know, Kevin Spacey, that's like a mega superstar actor when you think about it but he, he had that look like in his face that like he'd been sucking a little dick, <laughs> right like he'd been sucking like 18 year old dick since he was like 25 yeah, yeah yeah i guess you could say that but that little confidence level to <laughs> a little fucking uh what's that shit that white people have when they get that white uh privilege privilege, privilege. Yeah, that, i suck with young dick entitlement yeah like he's that, entitled like to he would the... walk around i only suck 16 year old dick <laughs> he's in <laughs> And he's entitled to it. That's right. I don't. I don't talk to twenty-four year olds. That milk is tart. <laughs> I suck that sweet milk like cereal milk. <laughs> that filthy fuck. Fuck him. Son of a. And his bitch. secret garden of evil. The guy that cracks me the most is the Democrat, the, the dude that's running from... Let me tell you something. The, yeah, yeah, dude in uh, Alabama, is yeah, it? You yeah. know I love you like a brother, right? Right, and likewise. When I moved, when I moved to Boulder in 85, I had $10,000. At 18, I just settled, so sued some guy. I put 10 in the bank, and I walked around with eight like Johnny Bananas. I went through it in a month, right? Because that's what we do. We right. went through it in a month in pizza slices. Who eats $8,000 in pizza <laughs> slices? It's a lot of pizza. And nickel bags. So how to get a job? So I went through this mall with a fake credit card. And I mean, I banged everybody out. But during when I was robbing the fucking mall, I applied for a job there and I got the job. So they fingered me a month later. I robbed every place in there and never got banned from the mall. This motherfucker was hitting on so many 16-year-old chicks, they banned him from the mall. And wait till they start getting the reports from the roller skating rink. Yeah. See, he killed all those bitches. Because I know that motherfucker was roller skating on Sundays to fucking Elton John songs. And that's crazy because one of the, the the law enforcement around there, you know, said, yeah, you know, he's he's a he's a known he's known to talk to underage girls, blah blah blah. It's a common it's common knowledge, and you know that's that's law enforcement saying that about your ass, you know, when you're running for office down there. You know what's crazy? When I was it's eighteen, crazy. I hated talking to underage girls. When I was 16, I hated talking to 16-year-old girls. 
Do you know that? Like, I liked older <laughs> women. I always liked talking to a little older. Even a couple of years at that age makes a big difference. It does. Like, that's why when I see guys that are 50 dating a 22-year-old, what the fuck can you be talking about? Whistles? Yeah, what, what, yeah, <laughs> what do you, you got to... Yeah, what do you got to... What do you have in common? After you fuck them 20 times and you spill <laughs> milk on them and, you know... And, and then a poor girl that's 20, she's blown a kid in high school. His milk tastes like going to Kevin Spacey's nephews. <laughs> and then she decides to suck a dick as old and ratty as mine. And that's like skim milk with fucking goat cheese in it. <laughs> And fucking vomit chunks. What do you do? Do you stick around and take that abuse? <laughs> you know, I would imagine, depending on the, the pocketbook, you know, some stick around. But if it's a broke motherfucker, they're out. Boom. Out of here. Oh, my God. Good to have you on the show. Good good, good being Fucking here. Uh, never in my life have I met somebody who's been in more bands. You're the man. You're the <laughs> this is the truth. Profits of rage, profits of fire, <laughs> 10 Puerto Ricans and a knife. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Two Mexicans and a beanie. No, no, they're pinga. <laughs> well, do you hear their pinga? No, 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 no. <laughs> and man, that's a big credit because that means you haven't stopped since God knows when did this all start. Well, you know, um, our first Cypress Hill album came out in 91. Jeez. But, you know, we like you know just as enthusiasts as as this shit was our hobby this is the shit we love run dmc was like you know the first shit that turned me on to hip-hop really i mean there was stuff out before run dmc and we learned about that later but that was the shit and you know just doing it like emulating those guys we were doing it probably like in 85 86 but you know we turned pro by getting a deal in in 1990 and releasing the album in 91 and from there you know we just kind of you know we we were thankful for having the fucking opportunity because you know we didn't know if our shit was gonna hit or not we knew we had some different shit that was kind of hard to swallow you know what i'm saying like uh you know like um a brand new porn chick trying to you know suck off what's his name uh Harvey Weinstein? <laughs> no, yeah, him, yeah. <laughs> Man Dingo or, the, or something? Or the elephant, fucking uh, <laughs> Jeremy. I could, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ron Jeremy. He yeah. came out here and played the harmonica. Yeah, oh, I bet God. he did. He's a bad motherfucker. He's a cool dude, man. He's a man. cool dude. Very man. cool dude. No, what I'm saying, you know, it, it, shit is tough. When you first see Jeremy, what's his name? Ron, Ron Jeremy. Jeremy. When you first see Ron Jeremy, you freeze. You freeze up. <laughs> you think of Rock Hudson. You think of skinny people and shit. <laughs> yeah. You no. think of all those hoes. He busted the assholes. Yeah. And you're kind of hesitant to shake his hand. <laughs> yeah. And while you're shaking his hand, you're like, there better be Purell in the bathroom. Yeah. Or you better have some fucking surgical talking. gloves. Bro, on. he talked to me in a bank lot one time. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's a cool dude. Who the fuck am I? This is 15 years ago. I go, hey, man, you're a bad motherfucker. And he stopped. And he talked. You think about it, he's a legend in his field. He really is, you know? man. So, you know, like, again, <laughs> our music... I can't wait till somebody says he sexually harassed him. Oh, That's yeah. going to be the best. He's like, bah! bah. I yeah. had them all, bitch. Sue me. I sexually <laughs> harassed him on tape and got paid for it. Yeah. That's crazy. crazy. No, 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 no. It's a different world we live in. Oh, yeah. I'm not even going to put my, hand, my arms around women no more when I take headshots. <laughs> I decided shoulder to shoulder like the Just Marines. Don't say shit. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> because you never know. I know some of you got sued for headlocking people. You know, like when the UFC fighter says yeah. to headlock them? Two UFC fighters. That's why they're not allowed to headlock you no more in pictures or strangle you and shit. Hey, man, I just asked for a picture and now I got this broken fucking neck. <laughs> yeah, but you know what's crazy uh -huh. to me that I've been thinking? I'm 54, I'm a little older. Like everybody says rap started with, let's pretend. I don't even know. Let's just pretend I'm talking out of line here. The Sugar Hill Gang. Right. Let's pretend, you know. Well, they, they were like, I think, the first to, one of the first to put out a big record. I saw something the other day that blew my mind. I'm going to show you guys real quick. I want you to put on the Fonny All-Stars live from Japan, Ponte Duro. Okay, this like this is what I was thinking about, like how. Okay, let's take what's the what's the the the, the form of music that first started in '83 on um, the boxes. They used to put boxes out and do the wars and shit. Yeah, that was based off of uh, 
you know, the DJs like Cool Herc and Grandmaster Flash. What were they doing? They About were wars. Yeah, yeah. And I would spin on my head to spin around. Yeah. And then I would get up and instead of fist fighting, I'd throw it. was like. They were break play- dancing? They were playing break, break dancing. Yes, they were playing breaks while the, the, the guys were break dancing. You know, b boying. B boying. All that. Like the, right now, the, one of the best jujitsu schools is. The ones with the one, the dudes where they were break dancers, yeah, where they have a break dancing school. Those and, two uh, jujitsu schools, which are Tenth Planet, those motherfuckers are killing people, killing because their bodies. What's the name of the song? I have oh, live in Japan. P O N T D U R O. This is one of the weirdest things. I just when I write at night, I put YouTube on, and I put the music on one i don't really hear the music but i do it's just there and you're writing and you're right. typing and you're doing this it's and ambiance and it's something and i was and this came on right there the second one that, that's in africa is that okay yeah yeah that's the one i okay. want to i want to show okay and there's a part here i see where you're going but this is beautiful because this is 19 uh 60 something it's not even about the music in this okay. let it queue up a little bit it's about the percussion it's about the percussionist and what he does. Okay, so the guy is playing bongos with sticks. His name is uh, Roberto Rorena. All right, you see him yeah. with the with the fucking Earth Wind and Fire suit on. <laughs> the only the only Puerto Rican dude with an Earth Wind and Fire suit on. That's Ray Barreto. All right, and then speed it up a little bit, uh, Lee. They start dancing and singing and fucking around. And then you got Hector Laveau there. You got Ismael Rivera. You got an all-star band. They're in... Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And there's a scene here where the bongo player starts dancing. But I want you to see what he's doing. Right there. Go. Right there. Click it. Watch what he's doing. This is 1973. Rick James live from Africa. 71. This is, or 73, or 74. This is before Muhammad Ali hmm. fought uh, one of the big fights. George there. Foreman. George Foreman. They decided to do a concert for peace. And they got B.B. King and... Uh, you know, they got everybody. The funny all-stars, and they got <laughs> this guy and that guy. But the most impressive... Was Rick James. No, was no. James Brown. Sorry about that. James oh. Oh. James Brown in, Af- in uh, live. I'm sorry. Fucking Rick James. Rick James is smoking crack in Buffalo. <laughs> 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 All this right. Uh, and Zaire. The payback. The payback, yeah. So this was the concert before the fight. What's... What, I don't even know how old he is here, but put this on loud. He's got to be in his 30s by here. here. Maybe 40s. Maybe 40s. This man will make your liver quiver. Now, this is Africa. This is not the Bronx or Los Angeles. This is nowhere. This man will freeze your knees. If you will, let's all welcome the world's godfather of soul, soul brother number one, James Brown. This guy went from being the cape James guy to the announcer. Brown. Look at this. Look at this savage. He came out with an entourage like he was in a boxing body. <laughs> Look at him. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Look at this shit. This was Michael Jackson. This oh, was yeah. Prince. He showed him how. This was, you know, I, I just showed you a Spanish dude that nobody's really heard of. Breakdancing in 1970. That was maybe 72. Yeah. Because the funny All Stars big tapes were Japan, Africa, and they did Yankee Stadium. And they, they the Puerto Ricans danced so much that that was the first time they ever thought about canceling a baseball game the next day because huh. the field was fucking torn up. The field was fucked up. <laughs> oh, man. That's awesome. And you still tour. Yeah. Now, what? who do you tour with every other week? Like, every week you tour with somebody <laughs> fucking different. Like, well, one you know, week you're with the Beatles, the next week you're with Soundgarden. <laughs> uh, you know, the last uh, year and a half I've been juggling between, you know, Cypress Hill and Prophets of Rage. And, uh, you know, I'll be on tour one month with this group and then 
next month it'll be with that group and just been going back and forth like that and it don't stop you know fortunately it's it's still fun i still have a passion for music and creating it and playing it so you know it's uh you know it's fun you know especially going from one one thing to another one which is very hip-hop but <clears throat> you know um it transcends hip-hop like in terms of like our fan base you know they they like alternative music they like the the rock and punk and and metal shit as well as hip-hop you know so there it's it's a different uh type of energy but then you know you go with the prophets of rage and these motherfuckers just like rocking the fuck out so it's uh completely two completely different energies but um it's it's fun on both ends it's it's you know sometimes it gets a little bit much because you know you're away from home for so long and if you you know i got a family so it's kind of hard being away from the family so much but in terms of you know what we've been trying to do with it and you know the point we're trying to get across with the music and then just as artists rocking the fuck out you know it's everything is is uh going really well you know we've been touring a lot and we're about to, you know, take these next two months off, three months, whatever, and, and work on some new music for it. As well as we got some Cypress Hill music on deck coming out, like two albums. A lot of music. You said before the podcast that you, you're still having fun, and you, t- you just said it again. You've been doing it for at least 30 years, it sounds like, it probably even more. Was there, Were there times over that 30 years that it wasn't fun, that you didn't like it? Well, you know, in this business, it's it's shark infested. So, you know, it's always going to be having its ups and downs because, you know, in the end, you know, you're trying to put your music out there. You're trying to make a living. You're trying to, you know, do what do what you love and all that stuff. And there's a lot of politics in between all that. It's more than just making an album or a song and then putting it out. And then there's an explosion and you're famous and all this other shit. There's a lot of stuff in between that and and uh, there's no actual school to teach you the process kind of got to learn you know hands on you know as the steps progress you know what i mean especially in hip hop and uh you know i wouldn't take nothing back to be honest with you you know the good times and bad times make up what's happening right now you know for better for worse and shit like that and for me i consider you know all that stuff you know, that wasn't so great learning experiences as opposed to, you know, some negative shit where, you know, to complain about something. Because who's going to listen? Who wants to hear you complain? Exactly, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to hear that. So if I'm I'm complaining, that means I'm bitter about some of the losses I took. So, you know, I'm never bitter about that because a loss is a learning experience if you you look at it the right way. So, you know, I'm good you know it's helped me all those things help me progress to where i am now which allows me to be in two bands and flip styles the way that you know i'm able to do from one show to the other and from one creating one style and creating the other with the other guys you know what i mean it all that stuff led up to where i'm at now so you know uh, you take that if you're passionate about what it is i mean it's like going up there and having a routine and some of the routine is hitting and some of it you know you need to work on when you when you go home right or the fucking shit bombs out like you could you could say oh man i ain't i ain't going back up on the mic i fucking bombed out or you be you go back and create something else and come back out and fucking tear their asses up again you know it just depends on how much passion you got for it and you know i've always had a lot of passion for music you know before i was even you know creating it with my bros you know um so i for me it's it's all about that you know still loving to do it do taking risks you know that uh normally other people won't take creatively stuff like that man i, I I love shit like that because it's a challenge. Let's be strictly honest here. I pretty much booked a podcast with Lee. Somebody calls me. I talk to Lee. Lee talks to me. We put his name down, and we see where we're at with that person. You know, right. and uh, it's funny that because of my touring schedule, and then I was trying to write a sitcom, 
Tuesdays were always being rough for me, plus an acting class, plus the baby. Yeah. And finally, when I freed up, uh, so many people mentioned you to me that it was overwhelming until I said, let me go down there and see what this uh, podcast is about. And from the minute I walked into your studio, your, your, you know, what time you got there, your, you know, your gentleman, the staff you had, I was very uh, taken back by you, by what you were doing. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, I, I love to talk. You know what I'm saying? I, I still got that residue cocaine from 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it comes up every once in a while. I sweat every once in a while, and you hit like a cocaine <laughs> rock that got caught right. in a fat thing. <laughs> and I can't, there's nothing I can say to you because I'm listening to you, and you're exactly on the money. But what I admire about you the most is what happened to the spin doctors? I, listen, I'm just acting. What What yeah. was the song they sang? Dear, <laughs> then, <laughs> went to then, I adore you. Now, come yeah, on, baby. Uh, baby. Uh, this time. Yeah, that's uh, karaoke this, now. Right, okay. So if, if you. <laughs> Now, I am not putting down the spin doctors. No. By no means. They had big hits. They had big hits, and then whatever happened, one guy became a carpenter, the singer hated the piano player. You're the, you're the type of dude that reinvents himself every 90 days, and then when he, that's how you keep yourself fresh. <clears throat> I had to go to my agent two months ago and go, listen, I don't want to hear about another date on the road again. He's like, what are you talking about? You're selling out. That's not the point. That's not the point. See, that's what you motherfuckers are wrong. And then, yeah, you make a little change, and then you buy a house, and guess what? Now you're in debt. Yeah. Now you're doing something that you used to love, but it became a job. Yeah. When you choose an art as a career, you want to get up tip-top magoo and attack it every day. It's a lot of. It's a fine line. I, I tell you, and I know you're going to tell me, when it was me, you... This dude and fat fucking Joe in a garage with no money. Those were the best times we had when we were just rapping. And it was just us. We were making some good music. All of a sudden, something came in that was called money and pressure. And we adjusted. We adapt. That's what we do. But it fucks up the main thing of what you're doing. What you're doing, you're not letting the money get in the way. You're switching it up. You're switching it up. I'm sitting here in awe because I have a hard time raising a daughter loving my wife because if you know if you don't give your wife love right then that's a complete different thing i had to take it from massage yesterday 60 bucks two chinese people <laughs> one rubs her one rubs me and we hold hands together <laughs> they put rocks on your neck right but on. you know what it puts a smile on your face and that's yeah. an hour and a half of my time i got the podcast and then you got to go on the road right we don't have i don't have all that shit I wish I had the time and energy, you know, we make a road, we, I don't know where you live and I don't give a fuck, but you got to get on that 405 today, oh, you yeah. see, when they put a picture on Twitter oh, yeah. of the 405, that, they don't know how we live with that, that's, that's every day though, that's every fucking day, that's serious, so you going to visit somebody, is four it's, fucking hours, yeah, the other day I had a meeting, and that's just getting there, that's just getting there, two, two days, Friday, I had a meeting, and on the way back, Lee called me. He goes, how'd it go? I go, we could have done it on the phone. <laughs> I had to go to Wilshire. <laughs> we could have done it on the phone. This is why we have Skype. <laughs> and this is why I admire you, because you find time to, wait a second, not just tour, people. If, if all I had to do every weekend was go out and say the same jokes I've been saying for 10 years, and nobody would say nothing, that's what I would do, and it'd be easy. But I know you're the type of dude that wants to create. You want to create. And when you want to create, you have to find time to create on yeah. top of being a dad, yeah. writing, business, because this yeah. is a whole business. Now you got the, the setup, which I admire again. You got 10 shows going out of there. You, you know, you're smoking. Your, your employees are giggling. <laughs> Everybody's high at 8.30 in the morning. Stay high, yeah. They're eating donuts. They got tacos. Fucking donuts. You know, I mean, that's a, it, as an artist's point of view, you have the perfect artist life, which is what used to happen in this city as far as we were concerned. See, as a comedian, what you did was Be Real got a show. Be Real called two weeks ago. You said he met you at a restaurant. He wants you to be a garbage man in this show. Be Real's going to give you six episodes out of 13 every year. That means for fucking eight weeks, I'm not going to do dick. <laughs> two, two times a year. 
for six <laughs> weeks, I'm just going to focus on Be Real show. Right. Well, I got to call Be Real and tell Be Real Real. They got to shoot me out Tuesday because I got a gig in Philadelphia on Thursday. And guess what? I'm not going to be effective on your show. And I'm not going to be effective in Philadelphia because I'm thinking about both things. Right. Let me just focus on Be Real thing. Kill that shit. So the next season, that motherfucker brings me back for eight shows a season. <laughs> right. So you had that breather. In today's comedic world, you don't have that no more. Yeah. They found out they can make money with you. Why, why fuck with the nest? Yeah. Keep him on the road. Keep him on the road. Keep him on the road until he stops selling tickets. Now you're 48 and you have no acting experience. Yeah, when you oversaturate, man. You, you know, can't do it. You can't do shit. You yeah. got to fuck it. I'm going to have here surgery in a couple of weeks. I mean, 60 days I can't go on the fucking rope. My agents are going crazy. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> this is what being an artist is, that for 30 days... You go into a Denny's, you get the waitress a fan, and you go, don't let no b b buddy go back to that section back there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be there all day. I'm going to have eggs. I'm going to have the pot roast. I'm going to shit blood. But I'm going to stick it out here every day till five and write. <laughs> it's really weird, the creative process. Everybody has a different process. Everybody has a different process. And I know if, you, if I overstock you with business, how the fuck are you going to write lyrics? Yeah, it's, you know, it's tough juggling, you know, and... Uh, <clears throat> it's it's sort of like when it's all going well you have to keep it going so you got to keep everything fucking in the air and 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 keep it balanced for me like i said i i, I love challenges and 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 in terms of uh that challenge and the reinventing myself through different projects different groups different albums or whether it's solo or or with somebody you know that's something buster rhyme talked to me about like in the mid 90s when he had left one group to do his solo shit and it was tremendously different and uh you know he pulled me to the side one day and he said hey man you know you should um in his buster rhyme voice yo 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 son you need you know you need to be constantly doing shit and reinventing yourself be you know, do shit different. I know you got this group, but do do other things. And uh, that was a bad impression of him. But, you know, because I'm not really on my game right now. I usually do Busta Rhymes voice pretty good. But today I shit the pot. But, you know, he gave me that advice. And I kind of was hesitant at that time because, I, you know, I was all about Cypress Hill. And said, well, you know, this is where my 100% focus is. Why would I... You know, why would I fuck that up by going and doing some solo shit and, you know, just doing some crazy shit when things are going so well? You know, I was very focused, like you said, instead of trying, you know, having all these different things going on, I was very much all about the group. And um, years later, that's when I started thinking, you know, ah, right, well, I've done a lot of shit with the group. Let me start doing some different things here and there and i did a couple of mixtapes then i did a solo album and uh you know went back and started doing some group shit and then i created another group with the uh, exhibit and this cat named Der demrick called serial killers and we did a hardcore hip-hop album under that group for two albums and uh then i partnered up after that with with burner which we did uh three three albums called prohibition well they were two eps in one album and uh you know all that while i was doing a, a another solo album that i gave away which was called the prescription and uh, you know i just kept you know writing and writing for different things you know doing collaborations with other people and just keeping the Busta Rhyme shit in mind at that point. Like, okay, if I'm not gonna, if I'm gonna do something a away from Cyprus, I don't want to do anything like I do with Cyprus on this other shit. So I'm gonna be something completely different on this. Something's a different side of me on this shit as opposed to what people are are used to seeing with me with Cyprus. So, you know, I just took that from one group to another and even with profits like the way i i'm, I'm dressed up there with uh, with profits is completely different than what i do with cypress and you know that's to have that distinction and, and to have something different and you know and to make people ask why 
because you know people are always going to be like well why is he why does like his look over here is so extreme you know but that's the thing you know you reinvent yourself and you make people fucking ask questions and boom you've done your fucking job you know what i mean so i, I i'm just used to like taking these things on and 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 giving everything a different kind of um different kind of feel to it so it's not a regurgitated thing of what we do with cypress because i mean you know if i'm gonna do that i could just stay doing the shit i do with cypress and keep just, it uh you've worked with everybody in the business even our other boy danny brown i mean you've yeah. done you've salute done, to danny brown i like yeah, danny brown he's a good dude and it's just you continue to grow you don't stop you don't stop. There's no, there's no, and it's not like uh, you ever notice when a dude is progressing and he tries to act young. That's not you at all. It's in. I could see it when you sing it. When you were a kid, you like Spanish music. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, let me open the door before they call nine one one. I'm sure I have eighteen second. texts. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Before they call nine one one. Well, Joe is gone. Uh, I actually did one of the other shows. I did We Don't Smoke the Same. Oh, you did We Don't Smoke the Same. And yeah. like that was even before I met you. It like there's a lot of people in this town who don't like to promote people around them. And the, what I really liked was Ezone said he worked for you, and like got got gets to do the show now. So it's like, and then our other friend Roz dude, we've known I've known for years, eighteen he's, months, two he's years. He's been with yeah. you for years. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure. So it's it's just nice to see people who act loyally and are, are nice in this town oh well you know when we started be real tv you know and 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 it, it was called the 420 show as opposed to the dr green thumb show we changed it later because you know i said fuck it you know there's a lot of 420 shows there's not a dr green thumb show on dr green thumb fuck it so i switched the name and I, it started maybe with six people maybe less than that i think it was four people um myself a couple of djs and you know my partner in in the in the network and you know we we started off with the one show just because i realized the importance of a platform because i used to do a radio show on 92.3 the beat called the soul assassin show um which is different than the the, the show that dj mugs does on sirius now but uh you know this was in the kind of late 90s and and you know we we did some big things on the radio so you know when i left radio due to politics um you know there i was searching for a platform the streaming became the thing and i got into that and uh little by little i just you know as i we build our own platform in the streaming world i started recruiting other shows other people and you know some of our staff um, started as people in the chat room like that we would have this back and forth engagement like so um our our guy we got a guy called Sheiky I always or, call him or, Shecky yeah Sheiky Sheikadelic we Sheiky. call him but at first you know his his name in the chat room was Iron Sheik and, and him and I would have some crazy exchanges in the chat room talking major shit to each other but on some joke shit but like on some really foul joke shit you know what i mean because you know we that's how we interacted with our chat room we would call it the freezer because <laughs> it was based off of insults you know we'd just insult the fuck out of each other and they'd insult us we'd insult them but it was all you know love shit we realized that chic was a wordsmith you know he he could, you know, he could hang with the fucking best of them. We invited him down to the studio and he became, you know, a writer for the site in the beginning. Then he became an operator and then, you know, eventually, you know, part of the show. And with E-Zone, he started as an intern, you know, doing like stories and shit like that for the site as well. Because, you know, our site does stream and blog. And, you know, eventually we asked him to do, you know... To, to ho co-host the show with us, be up there at the table when we felt he was ready, and then we gave him his own show, you know, via the live platform and our YouTube. So we gave him two different shows. As you know, he's been around, and you know, he earned his way up. And then Roz dude started as an intern, went into you know an operator um, position. And now he's creating content through his alley review. So, you know, we, we try to step everybody up 
in some form or another. Uh, Nels started up with us as a, a DJ, with DJ Nels, and uh, you know he became one of the co-hosts of the show, and you know he coordinates the smoke box and stuff like that. So, you know, all of our guys have been with us for a long time. So, we just try to create roles for everybody as as we go along man you know sometimes there's no job description coming in there ain't no the job description so so it's like you get in where Did you the fit fire alarm finally go off no i'm pretty sure someone's jackhammering at 8 30 at night yeah you looked at me like you thought i was farting when you heard that first no thing. that's the fire alarm guys hysterical i told you the fire the part was gonna be here and I, I don't give a fuck we don't know nothing we haven't we haven't been here in hours yeah is that them coming right now? I see the red lights. Oh, no. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Standing on my head spin nickels? <laughs> this went into a different I'm office. So, I'm sorry, guys. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> That's a first for everybody. It looks like we'll be moving into the studio. <laughs> yep. Come on. Oh, there it goes. Okay. It's off. Oh, you're absolutely right. God damn it. How do you know? It just went off. It just went off. They shut it off. They noticed the building is not on fire. They'll be coming here to do the walkthrough. Hi, guys. Everything okay? Yes, sir. This everything is, is fine. No, There's it's... nothing to see here. There's cop cars out there in fire departments and shit. Like... Should we put away some of this? Uh... Fuck no. We look like doctors. We got lust. We got roasts. <laughs> we had an incense. There ain't nobody out there. What the fuck is wrong we, with you? We had you a... my heart being on my chest. Jones. We had an incense problem, officer. <laughs> Oh, my God. oh yeah, man! Oh my God, this is way better than when the notary republic knocked on the door. You know, it's crazy how uh, they always tell you to reinvent yourself. You know, in this career, and it didn't seem like you reinvented yourself. That's not the word for what you did. You explored, right? That's a complete different fucking animal than what. But see, there's somebody out there. Something's going on out there. Should I turn my phone on to see if the landlord? No, no, no. It's like people with weapons. Oh, my God. Somebody's out there. I don't give a fuck. We got weapons. You got weapons. We got weapons. <laughs> we got weapons. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I guess somebody's out there. <laughs> what do you It's been a deal. A year ago. Do you guys remember when we used to smoke dope in that one building? And the black lady banging on the door at that yeah. time, and we were getting high in there. Hysterical. We didn't even get high in there. We weren't even getting high. We were hitting the it was, just, it was Felipe. Our buddy Felipe went going crazy. And then we were in there another time. It was the earthquake that time at 7 in the morning. With Rick Ramos. On fucking camera, you see the fucking earthquake. Only on a podcast, brother. Crazy. And then during the week, so you come home from a tour. <laughs> you wait, I'm telling you, because this shit baffles me. Ron White, 60. Ron White goes on the road every weekend, Friday and Saturday, like nothing. There are people, if I go on the road four weeks in a row, I wake up, I don't know where the fuck I am. The other day when I came back from New York, that Monday, I took a nap after jujitsu, And I went to bed at 2, 1.30, and I woke up at 5. And I honestly didn't know if it was 5 in the morning or 5 in the afternoon until my wife came in and said, come on, we got to go pick up the baby. Hmm. Like, it just throws me off completely. So I got to get my shit together. I got to get my game up, like be real, or <laughs> take vitamins or sleep more or do some shit. Sleep more. Yeah, man. You know, I, I, truthfully, I train for this shit. It's hard, man. You get older, you know, and you do a show at the pace that we do it, you know, that our music is at. Because when you think about it, and I don't think people do the math on this, but, you know, certain groups, when they do shows, especially with, golden age hip-hop shows they try to keep the music moving and up tempo so a lot of the songs are about 100 <clears throat> 100 beats per bpm and sometimes faster and a lot of the songs that like stir people up are at that tempo so when you got to do an hour and a half that's like cardio you know what i mean that's a lot of words you're spitting out there and moving around and uh, you know as you get older you better be active and doing shit to be able to do those type of songs at the at the highest level that, that that you can you know what i mean and for me you know for a second i was just kind of letting go and doing whatever and i had 
gained a whole lot of weight. But I was still doing the shows, but I, you know, giving a hundred percent with all that weight. But the way that I felt after the show was fucking crazy. I had to jump in buckets of ice and shit, and it was tough. You know what I mean? So I, I, I thought to myself, I'm gonna keep doing this, and this shit's still gonna be fun and not painful. I gotta take better care of myself, and I started, you know, eating better and, you know, working out. You know, aside from just doing the shows and stuff, like keeping active, so that I could do those shows, so that I could endure the the hour and a half, you know. And then when I started doing the profits of rage shit, you know, I had I realized that I had to step up the workouts because those shows are even harder, They're even harder than yeah. than than the Cypress shows, just because the intensity of the songs are are, you know. Um, they're on a different it's level. Energy driven. Yeah, they're yeah. Energy driven songs. Hey, you, okay, so trip this out. You know, I geeked out on this, right? You know, I some I w- wear my I watch and shit, and you know that thing has an app that counts your steps and calories and all this sort of bullshit, right? So it'll count your steps and lay it out in miles. So you know, I did a Cypress show at an hour and a half, and it came to about four miles something. You know, four point something miles. Right, did a Prophets of Rage show at an hour and a half, and it was like eight miles. That's how much you know. Fuck. More movement, how much more energy there was on that show, and that's not taking away anything with Cyprus. It's just it's a different sort of body language, different sort of energy, different kind of movement. And uh, man, I lost a lot of weight on that Prophets of Rage tour. It's I funny. Tell you. When I lived in Bold, the way before I got into comedy, got this. This was maybe the beginning of comedy. I was friends with this dude, and he worked at the University of Colorado, the Denver campus, in the music department. And what his specialty was, Cypress Hill was going on tour. They have a choreographer. Told you the fire department said, but he. Well, would, no, that's the name, bro. But he yeah. would come in to clean up your movements. Hmm. So he, we were eating dinner one day. We were friends, not dinner even over a table. We were at my friend's restaurant because he was in the halfway house for a while. I was in the halfway house, and the rest of the guy. And when he told us what he did, I nearly died. Like I'm like, so tell me this again. He goes. Disc and at the time I, I I I don't remember, but his biggest client that I was there when she was in town before the tour started was Janet Jackson. Really, nice. And he told me right out. He goes, "You got to remember one thing about these people. They're normal people." He goes, three months before the tour starts, I fly out to L.A. I meet with their trainer." And I explained to them the movements and the endurance, and because those tours, there's movement. You know, it's like your yeah, shit. Yeah, they dance a lot. They dance a lot. And he goes, "Well, celebrities don't take it seriously." So Janet would show up, ten pounds overweight, and the tour's a week away. She goes, "Here's the funny thing: that in the beginning of the tour, and everybody knows this, seventy percent of the vocals are lip sync because of cardio. Yeah. You can't do the whole thing. Yeah, by." 260 days in she's a, you know what I'm saying she's doing all her and own shit and you think of all that and I, and I still remember signing with this agent and bro I had an hour you know what I'm saying but it was an hour of just material yeah and I still remember going I'm headlining but I ain't headlining and it took me like a year to learn how to headline and to get I, the chops for headlining and when I started headlining listen bro I'm always doing something Four days a week I walk, I throw kettlebells, I go to jiu-jitsu, I swim. When I do two shows on a Friday night, bro, when I get back to my hotel room, it's like I got beat up by ten fucking white belts. <laughs> From my hips down, I could feel, and then say, I got to take two of those, Tylenol PM, yeah. uh, not, not the PMs, the regular Tylenol. Yeah. And it's so weird how you have to get into touring shape. Yeah. And if you eat shit, you're dead. Yeah, and you're if you feel drink, like shit. Yeah. you're dead. You know, if yeah. you're not 22 no more. So yeah. you drink a bottle of tequila, when you wake up at nine, you're like, ugh. 
It doesn't it doesn't get any easier. It's fucking wild how you read about it. The reason why you get partly into your field, especially in the beginning, is for the party. Yeah. And then after you do two or three tours living that, you go, wait a second. This ain't the way to fucking do this. I got to chop something up. The women got to go. The powder got to go. The dudes who have the powder got to go. Everybody got to fucking Everybody go. Everybody got to go. Hey, it gets heavy, man. You know, because what 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 you have available to you at that point is whatever you want. <laughs> and you will indulge in it if the wrong motherfucker's around. You know, and that's that's the thing. And then that shit starts wearing, tearing on your fucking body, adds years to it. And, you know, then you're spending time after that trying to recover from that shit. And, uh, you know, I think if you take care of yourself, obviously, you give yourself more years and, and you know, you're doing yourself a favor and, at that point. And, but at this at this point, you know, like if you're still as a as a so-called golden age rapper or golden era hip hop rapper i should say um you know a lot of us still do a lot of shows you know not not just cyprus but a lot of cats from that time and what you see now is a lot of these guys are 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 now training getting in shape like look at red man for instance you know he trains all the time he's a fitness fucking junkie but really that's to you know for his health and to be able to do those shows on the highest level that fat joe ain't fat joe no more yeah he slimmed out too i mean you know you, everybody's more or less taking care of themselves a little bit better than the generation before him and i think you're going to see more of that and that's good man you know because there wasn't as much education on how to take care of yourself and eating right and the right workouts for you know different people because everybody there everybody's body and you know responds to something different you know so well the first general road you don't know your boundaries and people are inviting you to shit and you're eating like a savage you're uh you're doing consuming. drugs you're drinking you're consuming consuming and everything you're waking like up for savage. radio which let me tell you something that, uh, if you have drugs women shows the worst thing out of everything that if you don't do it really makes you fall apart is sleep I didn't know this till I got older, and I got sleep apnea. And they were like, you have no idea. You sleep six hours, yeah, you sleep, but you don't recover. You don't recover mentally or physically. Three, four nights of that shit, you're forgetting your lyrics up on stage. You know what I'm right. saying? Because you're not, you're not sharp. You're not getting a full sleep, yeah. You got to sleep. The, the working out makes you sharper. Putting your pen on the fucking piece of paper, it all helps out. And... Uh, it's weird how my life is. I've been doing 20 weeks a year, 20, 20, 25 plus the last five years, Lee. And finally I go, you know what? I got to slow it down a little bit this year. Get my ear fixed from the flying. Yeah. I used to swim in the pools and the water stays in there. Then I can't fucking hear for four fucking days. Hmm. Then I got equilibrium. I got nausea. All that shit. I don't need that shit. You're doing a New Year's Eve show? Uh, not not that I know of. I mean, we used to do them in New York City, you know, once upon a time. But then we shifted over to to doing Halloween. But uh, it would be cool to to do a show on fucking New, Z New Year's Eve. Just you know, the right scenario, I guess. But uh, yeah, we haven't played on New Year's Eve since. <sighs> Fuck, I can't I can't even remember. It's been so long. Now, who do you go into the studio with next? Is it Cyprus or? Well, you know, right now we're finishing mixes on on uh, Cyprus's uh, two albums. Right now, Muggs is finishing the mixes on on the album that he produced, and then there's another one um, that was produced by another producer, and he's uh, in the the middle of mixing those songs. So, you know, right now we're we're in uh, finish up mode. But uh, so the next time, but the next time I'm in the studio to like create some new shit is uh, with Prophets of Rage. In uh, in the next couple months, we're gonna start working on another album, and uh, I'll just be flooded with music <laughs> next year. Yeah, it's an impressive dude, man. To juggle yeah. all that shit, 
and the calls from your agents and lawyers and shit, that drives me up a fucking wall. Yeah, you know, everybody p- tries to pull you a different way, man, but, you know, you kind of got to stay the course that you want to be on. And, you know, fortunately, I got uh, two bands with bandmates that are very understanding, cool dudes to be around, like good people, funny as hell. Um, Who's in Prophets of Rage? Uh, Prophets of Rage is uh, Tom Morello, Chuck D, Tim Comerford, oh, that's right, that's right. Brad Wilk, and DJ Lord and myself. And uh, that's uh, two guys from Public Enemy, which is uh, DJ Lord and and, uh, and Chuck D, and uh, Rage Against the Machine. Uh, three guys from Ra- yeah. Rage Against the Machine, Timmy C., uh, Brad Wilk, and, and Tom Morello, and myself from Cyber. My Tom Morello story. What was on Sunset next to Coffee Bean on Fairfax? Not now. Now it's a burger place. Before that, it was something different. Maybe it was a Mexican joint. It was something fucked up there. Yes, it was. It was a burrito joint, one of those California burrito joints. I'm talking 2001, guys. Right. I used to cop on Fairfax Reefer. So I would walk over there and then be hungry and go to that whatever it was. And I'm sitting outside one day, and there he was, Tom Morello, by himself eating. Hmm. And on the way I threw in the garbage, I don't bother people. He said hello to me, and I go, are, are you who, I, who the fuck I think I am? Or am I smoking too much weed? He goes, no, it's me. I'm to meet you. And that was it. Nice yeah. guy. Cool dude, yeah. Him. I didn't ask him for a picture. You know me, dog. I want to oh. take pictures. I don't want to bother him. He'll do it. You know, yeah, yeah. Out. That's the thing when about him. When they're fucking he eating, I don't want to do it. He was right. just sitting there in the middle of biting. Yes. Yes, it was a burrito place because I used to go in there and get the meat, the long meat tacos and shit. I was at 418. Long pounds. meat? No, no, it wasn't a one. It was like a chain. It really was a good chain. Before that whole thing became what it was. It really doesn't matter. I was just yeah. telling my boy here. Yeah. I yeah. bumped into him nice one time. He was a fucking gentleman. No, he's a good guy. He he don't mind taking pictures for the fans. You know he don't he don't uh, he don't turn anybody down. That's what I like about these guys. Is that they'll they'll take the time for fans. Sometimes with the blue penners, you know they give those guys a hard time. They'll make him work for it. What's my name? If you don't know my name, I'm not signing. <laughs> Shit like that. You know. <laughs> I'm not really familiar with the music industry. For like the last ten years of the comedy industry, they're doing a lot of self-releasing and public. Like, do you put out this stuff by yourself? Are you on and out like a label? Or I, I put out uh, the prescription stuff by myself. Um, you know, it was just I, I put it up on uh, I believe it was LiveMixtape.com and DatPiff, and let let it be shared out from there, and then put it on the SoundCloud. And, and and did that so yeah you know we did it a hundred percent independent and gave it out a hundred percent for free you know in terms of uh doing an independent album that that i sold i did one with uh duck down records called smoke and mirrors many years back and uh, that was my one and only like endeavor in doing a solo album and selling it you know like with uh with uh, some of the music as of late, I've just given it out, and you know, in terms of the the hip hop shit. Um, but I figured, you know, man, I've been in the game for twenty twenty five years, and at the at the time I was doing these mixtape, uh, th- or this particular mixtape, which was called the Prescription. It wasn't even a mixtape; it was an album. I just gave it out for free. I thought, you know, I've been in this game for for this long. Let me. Let me give the fans something special, you know, that uh, they don't have to pay for. And it's just one of those things where, you know, we gave them free music. And uh, it worked out for me. A lot of people love that shit. And, you know, I made videos for it proper like any album, any other album. And, uh, you know, I did many shows off off of those songs and stuff like that. So, it, it you know, I managed to... to, to do some solo work in there and uh but mostly you know i've been about the groups but uh you know like i say you know i, I don't mind juggling i don't mind the challenge you got balls of steel brother <laughs> and, that, and listen that's what it takes 
That's what it takes. It's not that even nobody's saying no to you. And you, you know, it's not like you're Alanis Morissette. You put out a song, the thing bombed. Now you come back singing top ten. Yeah. And he scratched my back and fucked me in a movie theater. You know what I'm saying? No. It's it's not that. I'm are, those, not, are those lyrics to the song? Whatever the fuck they are. And, 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 Close yeah. enough. And you came in my mouth and, 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 and you closed your eyes. And you know and Every time she scratched your name, I hope you I hope you feel it. I hope you feel it. While I'm here to tell Harvey. Whatever the fuck. <laughs> To remind Harvey, huh? This is a reminder. You didn't, you didn't get away, cocksucker. Oh, no. You might be in rehab, but when you get out, I'm firmly a statement. Oh, yeah. Uh, you think he's getting off of that just because he did rehab? He's trying to, obviously. First off, you can't get out of jail that's rehab. That's the oldest fucking trick in the book. Me and my buddies were pulling that one in 84. <laughs> you get busted for two ounces of blow. You make bail. You go to your house. You hug your mother. You do one last line, and you go to the nearest rehab, and you tell them to smuggle you in coke. If they give you UAs, you stick to it. You get a Bible. You go to church. You put a fucking camera on you. You have people follow you and take pictures of you. That is the oldest scam in the book. It's yeah. like right now. I go out with Be Real and Lee Syed. Me and me, we're, we're three in a car. At the light, we make a light, and some guy says something to us. He pulls a gun out. Lee Syed has a gun. He shoots a guy dead. The guy shoots Be Real in the leg. I, sh I, take the Lee from, I take the gun from Lee. I shoot another guy dead. Guess what happens? I fake a heart attack. I don't know nothing until us three can get our stories together. You know what I'm saying? And you fake... Yeah. What about like, that team from Boogie Nights? Which one? With the guy. With the guy. With the guy was, I, I'm not going crazy, am I? The guy who ran the stereo store. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You fake a heart attack for three days. He took days. the money and just ran. You always fake a heart attack. And you, it gives you 72 hours to come up with the thing. Your attorney sits at the door, and I call Be Real on the bat phone. Not the line line, but the <laughs> yeah, bat, 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 bat phone. phone. And then yeah. Be Real tells me, no, I shot the guy. The guy's got your fingerprints. And then I come back, and I don't know nothing. Be Real got shot, and he fell on me. And I was holding the gun. The gun must have gotten fired. But before the cops came, I put alcohol on my hand to eliminate the Illuminati. You know, <laughs> you always, you know, they go into the, they do the obvious, which makes them seem even more. I mean, he's buried. He's done. He's done because he left a trail of paperwork. Right. He's left a horrible trail of paperwork. He did destruction that's undestructible. But it's the way of the world. You play with fire. You know what I'm saying? If you, you follow me, dog? Yeah. You did this the old American way. A lot of people come here. They're naive. They team up with somebody. Next thing you know, they're telling you, yo, dog, to be in this rap group, you got to carry a key over to Denver. <laughs> you know, to be part of our fucking Swami Salami team. <laughs> a fucking, you know, non, you know. It's it's crazy what happens in this industry to people. It's a shame what happened to those girls. I also want the name of the agents that sent them over there. Yeah. Because they knew what was cracker lock, and they knew this guy was going to open up the door with a robe but, you and know, a bowl of strawberries. All them motherfuckers knew about him. You know. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. You know, so they can all be guilty of the same shit, well, not what, saying something. You talked about him at the beginning of the podcast. What about the mothers who agreed to let Roy Moore date their daughter? That motherfucker wasn't allowed at the mall. You think about that for 10 minutes. You go home tomorrow when you ain't thinking about your children or what's important. Go, wait a second. I mean, I'm 40-something years old. I'm a grown man. <laughs> Nobody's ever thrown me out of a fucking mall. <laughs> <laughs> and I shoplifted from GNC since the age of 12, right? Everybody's stolen something from GNC. No. Muscle dick pills, <laughs> aloha cream. What is that? Aloha, aloha. Oh you know, nobody gets thrown out of a mall. They made this motherfucker get out of a mall for just abducting little 16-year-old dogs. Waiting on them. Eight of them. Now, here's the other side of the coin. Let me tell you on the other side of the coin. Okay, my brother, you're very fortunate. You grew up in Downey? No, pretty much like East L.A. So your mother's from La, La Juana. Yeah. Migrated to California right away. 68. When did she, no stops. 
No, she escaped. Right, she escaped. Yeah. And then, yeah, 68, you were escaping. Yeah. Via Mexico or? No, she came in through, uh, it was either the port of Florida or New York, somewhere around there. Debbie, yeah. uh, And then she ended up in California. Yeah, she, uh, she had a cousin here that Perfect. came in on the lottery system. You know how in Cuba they got a lottery system, and if one of your kids' numbers pops up in that lottery system, they give you the option to leave the island, but you give up your, you know, all your credentials, your citizenship there, and uh, they let you go, but you got to start over, <coughs> you know. So, you know, if you were a professor, if you were a doctor, if you were a physicist, if you were anything like that, when you were going to the United States, you weren't going to with none of those credentials. Right, that's right. So, you know, <coughs> there was a family that, you know, my mother's family knew. And uh, they were going to the States. They didn't have no kids. I guess uh, apparently the, 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 the daughter had passed away recently. And they passed my cousin for this, this girl. And she went with that family, came into the United States and kind of grew up here. And when my mother escaped, she was the only relative here, you know, that was from, you know, her family. And so, you know, she was here. She was living in, I think, Inglewood, California. Now, when your mom came, raft, plane. Yeah, raft. No shit. Yeah, she escaped from prison, actually. She had a, she had a cousin that was, you know, a communist and worked in the prison. And uh, she was anti-communism, obviously, which was why she was in prison. And, uh, you know, he kind of helped her to get out of there because you know she, the future was not bright <laughs> for her in there so she escaped from the prison then escaped from the island on a raft and you know ended up in the United States our moms have similar my mom grew up in Cuba nine brothers nine sisters the whole fucking deal shitty fucking neighborhood when she was 16 and her sister was 15 and her brother, they all went to a dance on Violet. And my mom couldn't find her younger sister. So she went outside and she heard a noise and some guy was raping her in a bush. So my mom got a bottle and stabbed the guy and the guy died. My mom had to get rushed out of Cuba that night. Hmm. Went to the Bronx and then went back, got the alias. And that's why I never got social security. What a weird fucking... Crazy. Escape on a raft. Have you, have, you know, have people ever thought of it? Like, when I watched that uh, 4, 30 for 30, that's the first time I didn't sleep about something without doing meth or coke for four years, just deep in thought. Have you ever watched it? Yeah, 30 for 30, yeah. With the the, the, the two Cuban brothers. Uh, no. With the, the pictures. No, I haven't How seen How they that. got stuck in the Bahamas, and they hadn't eaten in three days, and they told about eating his hand, and, you know... <laughs> You know, who the fuck thinks this shit up? You know what I'm saying? That's crazy. And if Castro would have caught him, his brother had just won the world. Ivan. Hmm. Ivan. And then the other guy went to the Yankees, and he became a legend for the Yankees with the high leg kick and shit. I think about how fucking lucky I was that my mom got me out of there when she did. I'm thinking, how the fuck? But I got a New York City birth certificate, G-Money. Hmm. That's how kinky the system was. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Were you influenced by any Cuban music? I mean, you know, she used to listen to... My mother used to listen to a lot of the, the, the stuff that she, you know, was able to find. It was, you know, like Cuban music, Cuban bands and stuff like that. So, yeah, you know, I grew up listening to Celia Cruz and, you know, shit like that. And, you ever hear of a cat named Benny More? Yeah. Used to, you know, hear his records, too. El Gran Combo. El Gran Combo. Yeah. And, uh, man. <laughs> hey, do me a favor, Lee. Yes. Put on for my brother here, just so you can see our roots. Los Muñequitos de Matanza. Jesus, these motherfuckers are bad. Brother, B brother, these guys eat like beans once a month. <laughs> yeah. And I want you to show you how happy they are, because talking to you makes me think that you're related to these motherfuckers in one way or another. <laughs> Hey, you never know, man. Like Samoans, they're all cousins. M-U-N-I-Q-U-I-T-O-S, Los, L-O-S, Muñequitos, 
D-E Matanzas. M-A-T-A-N-Z-A-S. Gotcha. Let's see what you got up there. Watch these motherfuckers. This is this is your cousins in Cuba right here. I know this for a fact, bro. After talking to you, scroll, scroll down, scroll down. Keep going. Click it, click it. I'm just, click I'm, it. I'm just trying to get it to go away. That's all. That's all. Can you believe this? There's one video right there. That one right there. Click this. You got to watch these motherfuckers. This is a hunger. Click that and go away, please. You're killing me, Lee. I'm going to have to stab you with a pencil. <laughs> watch this. Listen to this music. Huh? Watch this chick. I would do anything to marry this sister. Anything. I'd go to Cuba on a sailboat and smuggle her in. You see this little black guy? He's about 92, Lee. But he's been doing this every day. That's why he's in tremendous shape. Now, the Cubans, they go for the pussy. Watch this. Old school Cubans. It's crazy that they're playing now with phone guys. Usually it's on, with the tambores on the bottom. No, no. This is brilliant, bro. This is where it got invented, though. They invented this oh, shit. Yeah. This came from Africa there. Yeah, for That's sure. it. This is second generation. Look how she covers that monkey. Look at that. Get these guys on tour. Look at this. Lee, what would you do for that little chubby Cuban to front in your face? <laughs> After she danced 10 rounds to this. I don't want anyone to front of my face, but I, that, that wouldn't be bad. That'd be a decent one. Lee, put that back 10 seconds for a second. It'd be sweet with the plantains. Put that back 10 seconds for a second. Listen to that Congo again. Right here, click it. You were talking over it. guy's 90 years old right there. No, no. <laughs> I was going to no, say. He looks like he's like 23. <laughs> say, shit, he's in pretty good, have good shape for a 90-year-old motherfucker. <laughs> I was like, damn, I wish I could move like that in 90, motherfucker. Oh, my God. <laughs> these, guys get, these guys get like $8 a month. To do and that? They, and they put that. No, bro, these guys tour all over the world. When you go see these guys, your fucking jaw drops. I saw him in Boulder. And like 90 fucking three at the Fox Theater, my friend called me. She goes, you know the, the muñequitos at the fucking... I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, bro, they're going to be heavy security. But you get in there, and they were fucking phenomenal. And they travel... You know, like my cousins are the other ones. My cousins are Eki Alfonso hmm. and Emmy Alfonso. Put Eki Alfonso on from with the guitar on Veil. He, I just... The other night, me and my wife are sitting there. And Anthony Bourdain's in Puerto Rico. And all of a sudden, the next one is Cuba. And we're sitting there. My wife gets up. I go, honey, get in here. My cousin's on fucking uh, Anthony Bourdain. V-E-O. This is the shit that put not a, out of Cuba. Uh, be real. And anytime you want to go to this club in Cuba, La Factoria, you, all I got to do is make the call. You're, you're doing it all wrong. Eki Alfonso with an A. Right there, the first one, Veo.
Can you believe it was there and he messed it up again? Well, it's right here. There you go. All right. Listen to what they're doing down in Cuba, dog. This is my cousin, Blood. Blood. His father is my uncle. It's your roots, brother. You know, you can't deny it. All those little things are pieces of who you are. And then on top of that, your uncle's a mariachi. You throw that shit in the mix. <laughs> who the fuck's going to stop be real and shit? You know what I'm saying? You got the mind of a Cuban in the back of a Mexican. Yeah. You never met a Mexican on Workman's Comp, do you? <laughs> nah. Never. You never see a Mexican. They keep, they keep right? working. You never see a Mexican. I made the well, way that that way. Fuck no. Mexicans. I know a Mexican who fell off a roof. He went to work the next day. He like, went to work happened. the next day. <laughs> <laughs> they don't miss a day, baby. I even told him the quote. I even told him to call Norton Freaking Associates. He wouldn't go for it. Oh, yeah, but Yama will wait. Yeah, you know. Let me give some like shout outs, brother, and we'll get you the fuck out of here. It has been, uh, you're very fascinating. And it's it's uh, it's amazing that we haven't crossed paths before. And yeah, now so it was only a ever, matter of time, you know? I want to do something with you for the simple reason is that I learned something. And we'll really take it to the next motherfucking level. Do me a favor, my little rook. Can you close that door? Look at this place. The alarm already went off one fucking time. <laughs> Jordan Card Kaha. 22 B 2BD guy 13. Ace hole. My brother down there under. The Australian warrior. Not so gingerly cold gold flavor. Mikey Cooper. Joji Boy and Beto Avran. What are you fucking nuts or what? Now, are you in for the month of December? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we got a couple of shows, but they're pretty much in California. So, you know, we're we're home. We're home. And then December, you also write every day. Do you write? Do you have a collaborator? Yeah, I mean, you know, we. I, I write, you know, for profits. I write for Cypress. I write for myself. I write for for others and stuff like that in terms of music and then you know with in terms of be real tv and content you know we all sort of brainstorm and you know try to come up with ideas there and stuff so you know we all you know sort of do that creative part together but musically you know when it comes to you know writing i, I get in the zone and and i do my part you know be real uh i looked around your place and you know when you see something that feels right you ever go somewhere and you're like, you know what, bro? This other place got the view of fucking downtown L.A. And I'm looking at white people eating at Chipotle and shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I felt like I was in a... And I'm not a hippie, bro. I've never been a hippie, but I felt yeah. I felt like I was at a place where I could smoke a joint at your place and go into a corner and write a bit. I would even consider doing, like, stand-up and streaming from there. Yeah. I like could totally I, I do that. Do, there's so many things I want to do with you from down there. There's a lot of things I want to do, but again, I'm like you, bro. I don't have the time. I ain't got time, time to fuck around with you motherfuckers. With you, I could tell you what I want to do, and you'll go, you know what, bro? Try this way, because we could do this way. The, this I could drop yeah. at 8.30 instead of 10.30. Don't curse on this bit. You know what I'm saying? Like something. Yeah, yeah I mean, for us, it's all unfiltered. Yeah, it's so. all unfiltered. But that's the thing. I really want to do some. Listen, uh, brother B, for us to sit somewhere and start smoking reef for what am I thirteen? <laughs> We've been doing that on Periscope every morning. That's how I motivate the troops. Yeah, I get on Periscope and I tell them to wash their pussy, a little cup of coffee, some bong hits, <laughs> and away you go on that bus, happier than fuck. Fucking. But you gotta go on a bus sober. That's one thing. You're angry. Yeah. And that dude smells like fucking dick. When you go on a bus stone, it's a completely different situation. Oh, yeah. You, you tend to overlook all you, the You the, tip the, the bus driver and shit. You give the bus driver a dollar bill and have a good day, cocksucker, yeah. on the way out. <laughs> but I admire what you're doing. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I'm not doing enough. But at the same time, I am doing a lot. You know? Doing a lot. You know, plus the reefer, plus the... The number one thing is trying to stay alive the next day for me. I try to train and lift weights and do push-ups and you stay know, active. Drink and store soda. That, you know what? Pretty soon I might have to give up smoking reefer. My lungs, uh, this is since I was 12. And then I lived in Colorado from 83 to 95. Mm. In that altitude, my lungs got acclimated. But between the crack, the reefer, 
<laughs> the, the fucking, uh, the fucking, you know, sometimes when you snort coke, you snort sheetrock and shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, normal you wear and tear. Me. Oh, man. A pubic hair. Who knows what happened to my lung? I got the nose fixed, and I'm still lacking oxygen, so I hold on every day. I got on it. I got Shroom Tech Sport, and it, it expands my lungs. Well, you could always keep up the edibles if you, you know. Stop. But now they're going to cut the edibles to 10 milligrams. You know how many edibles? Listen, there's going to have to eat double. There's, so, no. there's some mornings. <laughs> there's no way to eat doubles. There's some mornings, dog, where I eat edibles, and I eat so many of them that it's true. The next morning when you're shitting, you can smell the gelatin in the shit. <laughs> like a little, like a little, like this. You could smell the gelatin. Or it smells like weed. Or it smells like if, weed, if too. It's over, if it's dosed heavy, you'll, your shit you'll smell will it. smell like weed. Okay, I thought it's I was terrible. going crazy. It's but, terrible. Right. It's terrible. It's the, it's the craziest shit. And then you go to acupuncture, she puts a needle in your neck and a little smoke comes out. Like, <laughs> 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 That's when you know when you shit. You, and your acupuncture will ask you, how much are you still smoking? Last time I went, that's the same. Are, are we still smoking heavy? No. I gave it up for fucking the Julen. Yeah. The Julen. Yeah, <laughs> smoking fucking heavy. <laughs> and it's not like when I was 28 heavy. I smoke in the morning. I smoke when I get back from jujitsu. <laughs> still morning. I smoke at about 4. Afternoon. I smoke at about 6. And then you smoke a little bit before you watch TV at 9. That's it. It's not like when you're in the studio all day and you got 20 people around you, like your partner over here, and he's giving you a joint every seven minutes. <laughs> every seven minutes you had a joint for us and shit. That's fucking tremendous. You bring him everywhere with you. You take him on the road. He's your partner in crime. Well, I like know, him. He, he comes through some of the, the L.A. stuff because he he's studio manages Be Real TV, so he stays home. And make sure it's all running properly when. I'm when Mike Sosa, the Scarface, leave him here. Maybe he can help me run my business. Then we tell him that stay. I'll keep him on ice. He holds it down with the troops. Keep him on ice. <laughs> Be real. It's been a real pleasure, brother. Thanks for having me, brother. Man, I appreciate that you uh, took the time. I, I loved. I've got a great response from going in the fucking uh, the box, the box of debt. <laughs> I love that I got in there early. I didn't need an ambulance and shit. And uh, I think I hope a lot of people listen to this podcast because they they really learn something. They didn't learn about the music industry or you know how to make a million dollars. They learn how to be an artist, Word which up. which I think a lot of people have forgotten. And you know what, bro? For the first fifteen years I was doing this, people would go to me here and what are you talking about, dog? At the time, what artist are you talking about? Yeah. But for the last three, I felt something different. Being up. You have to respect it. You have yeah. to uh, see how it's affected it. I couldn't wait to fucking go on stage at 7.30 at night. Couldn't wait. Yeah. If you said to me, listen, there's a blonde in the next room with a Coke Rock and a clit ready to pop a nut, or you get on stage, I tell you I'm going to go get on stage. Now there's times I, I don't want to get on stage. Yeah. So you have to know when to strike, when to sit home right, and... Uh, you proved a lot of things to me. Maybe I'll do something else. I'll work the circus half the year. <laughs> I'll do comedy the other half. And I'll fucking uh, take over this world, man. Good luck to you Thank always. Thank you very much, bro. You're always welcome on here. You have any tour dates you want to promote, brother? Uh, we got December 1st with uh, Cypress Hill, um, Kings of the West. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be popping. It's gonna have Vice Cube, uh, Snoop Dogg, and ourselves and couple others it's going to be a really heavy gig it's the first time the three of us have been on the three groups have been on stage in one place in los angeles california and i don't know how long so it's uh it's a it's a pretty big deal that one and then uh you know with profits we have almost acoustic christmas coming up i can't remember the date for that one i'm high as hell but, me too, me too, me but too. You know, you know, I ran out of questions. I forgot whatever. I wanted to ask you about mixtapes, the differences, but even if you explain it to me, I ain't going to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like Cosby's victims right now. Uh, I wake up in the morning confused. I know what happened. I know he showed me his dick, but I don't know what happened after that. Because <laughs> I saw you have a couple of mixtapes. Now, a mixtape is something you make where? Well, you know, it's you make. Sorry it, to break your balls one last time. It's, it's, same thing, you know, like 
if you're gonna make a mixtape it's just like making an album the difference is you're just calling it a mixtape and giving it out for free and usually with the mixtape it's with songs uh of samples that you can't necessarily clear or more aggress- aggressive songs that you wouldn't necessarily put on your album and uh you know a lot of artists got into doing that 50 cent you know was yeah. very heavy with mixtapes made some great music doing mixtapes using other people's beats and shit like that and then that eventually primed him up to where when his album came out people knew who he was you know because he had been putting out so many mixtapes for free you know and really it's realistically it's just the album that you put out for free and you call it a mixtape and depending how you um make the transitions from one song to the next as well you know you sort of have to do all that shit have somebody host it as opposed to an album you know you're just doing songs and you got transitions but there's nobody talking in between there's nobody hyping up the record as you go along and mixtapes definitely do that especially east coast mixtapes but realistically not not too many people are i mean you don't hear about them as much as you used to more people are just like more artists are doing songs now just busting out songs and maybe eps and albums not not necessarily so many mixtapes four fucking songs put it on youtube or some other spotify right get a million two downloads and go on tour yeah and you you sell 82 dollars a ticket you can put any a studio a, sales. Anyone can put anything on iTunes now. Yeah, they can, we mean, can, you can put your music on iTunes now. I mean, SoundCloud was where a lot of people put their mixtapes when they put them out, and and albums and shit like that that they're going to give out for free. Now I don't know if it's the same get down, but you know you could find a lot there. Dat Piff live mixtape, live mixtapes and uh, and SoundCloud. You know what's another one? Uh, some other shit but like those are the three main ones you would find all the good stuff at you know but uh that's that's the get down the album is a s- <laughs> different because it's all shit that you would clear that you have to clear you know in terms of publishing and samples and all that stuff and then you sell that and that's out in the market for sale and you know it that's like it goes under all the statistics that happen you know where they track the record what it did what it sold you know what markets it sold best in whereas a mixtape you don't keep track of all that you get it out as as much as you can to the people you give it to djs you you know um sort of a similar process but not as much resource on it because you're just giving it away for promotion whereas the mixtape is the promotion piece before the album comes out to get the the hype on the album you know, because that's where all the hits are going to be. All the raw, crazy songs are on the fucking mixtape, and all the hits are on the album. That's usually the mentality on how how people were doing that. That's fucking brilliant. It's brilliant how the music industry has changed in front of my eyes. You know, I went from being a fan to becoming a novice. I don't know how nothing. I want to get a song. I wanted to download Omalo the other day by Willie Colon. Yeah. Jesus Christ. I had to contact my wife in the other room. She was pressing buttons for 22 <laughs> minutes. You know, all I had oh to do was God. go to the record store. She's in there pressing buttons, pressing writing buttons. letters, <laughs> trying to get a telegram to Puerto Rico to get the rights to fucking Willie Colon music. <laughs> you know. So, brother, I appreciate, like I said, you putting me on. And you coming on here and sharing your fucking knowledge of the art of anything. Because an art is an art is an art. It's just how you translate it yourself. Man. Thank you very much, brother. Thank you for coming on the church, man. God Hallelujah. bless you. Happy Thanksgiving. Hallelujah. And stay black. <laughs> Bill, that was great insight from uh, Be Real. Like I said... I went down to the studios. I didn't know what to expect at first. And I talked to his dudes, Ra's dude, the black dude with the camera, who was cool as shit. And Lee had gone down there and done a show. And I came back and I was blown away. And I went up to Lee Joe's podcast and I was blown away. And there's something I like to do, something in between that. 
You know, something in between that size. I don't well, they both have huge buildings. Yeah, those, those are, but which is a little bit more than we need. I but mean, it would be, be nice. Wheels looks like a like a, a somewhere where I would live if I was still being a you know like I would fix. If you were like a single guy, yeah, single guy with a fucking heater in that motherfucker. Oh my god, that would be crazy. A that, tub, that's you know, a reality like, show. Hot water right there, you know, it gives it that feel. But to see guy, listen, what keeps the clubhouse. You sharp, what has always kept me sharp, which I'm going back to do, is not hanging out at the comedy store, the Laugh Factory, or the Improv. When I got ready for Gabriel's stay, I was banned from the comedy store. Not banned. I had banned myself from going down there. <laughs> and it's weird that I started going to these places, and I would watch these young kids, and they would inspire me. And I put together like this 20-minute heater set in six months, hanging out with these young kids and closing the ha out every weekend. I would sit there. I remember I took you and I introduced you to the hooker and she took you to that place and tried to suck your dick for the small 40 and kissed your neck and shit. Oh, my God, with the bandages? With That's the bandages, a boy, a pimp She literally around. escaped from the hospital. So, you know, it's... It's uh, sometimes removing yourself and reminding yourself of where you're from and scraping up that, you know. That's why I'm dying to go to that place with you. Oh, the fourth wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're going to go. It's, it's, we it's go intriguing tomorrow. to me. I got the show. when we have to leave. We got to leave at Irvine. We got to leave here fucking tomorrow at 2 in the afternoon. Oh, gotcha. To get to Irvine by 6. Did you see the uh, fucking... Holy. When they put the... the, the Thank God know, the show wasn't tonight. No, you know, listen, my niece is flying in. Uh, there's nothing worse than flying into some place. And somebody says to you, listen, I'm working. And you have to take a bus or a train or a cab or something. In my world, there's nothing worse than that. You know, I flew all the way here. The least you could do is show up at the airport. I'll walk a half a mile. But just show meet me, meet me somewhere. So I'm not fucking unleashed in hell. So I had made plans to go down to pick up my niece tomorrow morning. I was going to leave the house at 5.30. You guys know oh I'm a fucking perfect. animal. I would, hit, I would smoke a little dope, have a protein shake, and then hit Denny's. <laughs> you know, it would take me an hour to get to Denny because the traffic closes to two lanes. You people won't believe this. Listen, you know, you all live in cities and towns and provinces, wherever the fuck you live. And every once in a while, don't you, aren't you driving down the street and you say to yourself, I do not fucking believe this sign. Okay, well, if you drive to the airport now, about a mile before you get to the airport, it's like road construction. Starts the week of November 20th and ends on January 4th. Well, isn't that the busy fucking time of the year at the airport? So they shut it down. You leave saw it. Yeah, they they have <coughs> and they've had construction there forever. Since Jesus left Chicago. So instead of four lanes, it cuts down to two for about ten minutes. You and know how many fucking cars are gonna drop and pick up people on fucking Wednesday and fucking Thursday? Do you people have any fucking idea? And they're shutting it down to two lanes. Not to mention they drive like animals. So they're saying from the fucking century road where you make the right Right, okay. To the top of the airport through the intense security this time. Dogs, two sets of security. Wow. I found this out Sunday because my buddy is a cop. And I talked to him and I go, I got to pick my niece up on Wednesday. He goes, what time? I go, uh, you know, he goes, ah, that's not a good idea. Now I talk to my Uber buddy and he goes, listen, she still got to walk upstairs to the platform and stand there like a savage. And if I don't see her, it's going to take me 45 minutes to get around together. This is, I, I love my nieces. <laughs> I don't want her out there. She's coming with her boyfriend, but what do I know? He's a mortadelle. This is the first time he's ever come here. Oh my God. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm doing is I said, listen, <coughs> I told her when she was landing. I know exactly, I know that airport like the back of my hand. She's carrying on luggage. I said, just walk straight, hook her right, and go sign your name and get the next cab out. I texted the address. My wife texted the address and fucking... Uh, I, t I told her exactly what to say so the dude wouldn't rip her off. You follow me? And I go, call me as soon as you get in that fucking cab. And I'll tell you what to say. It says, cocksucker, I don't get off this shit. <laughs> I take you to fucking Westwood to some salami sandwich. I, you don't need that shit. 
you're going to fucking, this is where you're going. So I'll meet her at the house and then we'll hang. Uh, there's a school, I gotta go to Mercy's 10 o'clock karate presentation. Is she getting a new belt? Yeah, she's getting a belt. She's breaking the board. Oh, snap. Her fucking head tomorrow. The whole fucking her head? Gym. I hope so. And then, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then there's like a little turkey dinner there. You gotta do a potluck. I gotta, I'm gonna gotta sit there for a fucking hour with him. And after that, I'll call you up and we'll get the party started. George Perez will meet us down there. We'll pick up the Agostino on a mission from Satan. And just like we did every year the last two years, I think the first year I was too high to drive, but I was too embarrassed to tell you. <laughs> that's all right. I think I think that's happened a few times. But anyway, I hope you people enjoyed this episode, especially. Oh, it's fun. Be real, talking about art, how you balance it, how you stay fresh, because this is what's been burning me the last ninety days, people. You know, uh, whatever you do as an art is always great. For my girl Jenica Jones, it's when you turn it into a business where you're like, why the fuck do I do this sometimes? Because people are going to break my balls anyway. I don't know. I put 20 years in. This is what the fuck it is. I don't know what the fuck to tell you. This could be crazy. But in the last episode, we were talking with uh, Ida about the century that you do. And you you were talking with Be Real about it. Like, do do you think that he came and talked about what's been bugging you? Is something with that, or, or is that reaching too much? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, It was just something that's on my mind a long time. You know, I became a comic to be a comic, but along the way when I got here, I kind of like to act from time to time, guys. Nothing wrong with it to get on the set, get some fresh legs for eight weeks. Why are you fucking on the set? You think of new angles. I got to think up of new angles, people. I've been hitting the same fucking drum for the same five years. I got to switch it around a little bit. So understand if I don't come to your town next year. Let's see what happens with Netflix. If not, me and Lee are going to put something together that's going to blow your fucking brain. All right? I've never let you down, cocksuckers. Never. You know why I'm your Uncle fucking Joey? That's number one. Number two, it's Thanksgiving. It's our fucking time right now. You know how lucky we are that we have each other? You know how lucky we are that we have that stupid fucking page? I mean, I love the kid who's fucking running it, but we got a bunch of momos on it. But you know how lucky we are? We get to chit-chat about the Vicodin problems and the pill problems and the blow problems and the sex problems. And that, you know, uh, I've always said I wanted to do a podcast that you took some home with it. I could just do a podcast and sit here and me and Lee could crack funnies and I could hire a writer. And it's a fucking radio show. This is not a radio show. This is a radio show from a little misfit Jew from fucking Boston who thinks he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't fit in, but he does. He's a sweetheart of a guy oh. and a fat fucking ex-con comedian with a weird sense. But let me tell you something. Nobody can get you off that bed quicker than I can, all right? So what I want to do is wish you and your families a fucking happy Thanksgiving, especially the church, the, the inner circle, the fucking Bobbies and the fucking Bobby Lalinguses and the, and the lawn... And, uh, you know, uh, the horse warrior and fucking your buddy, TJ Straccio, and the guy who fucking sends me letters, your buddy, Rico Pickett Petrocelli, and listen. The linguses. Yeah. Uh, no, the guy who sends letters on Gmail. Oh, uh, Dante Gazzini. Dante Gazzini. Listen, we got a great fucking family. This is a fucking great family. We, we had second chances in our lives and we took advantage of them and we're not the fucking king of what we do but we're holding on so thank you for giving us another year of your time you know what I'm saying number one I want to thank Arnett for always being with us from number from day one and this is why I love him because now you're an Arnett customer you know what time of the year it is it's ra you've rationed your MCT oil which is fucking tremendous you've outgrown your happy kettlebell and you're down to your last Alpha Brain Insta Pack because you know and it's going to hit you with the biggest sale of the fucking year. Oh, so this yeah. Friday, November 24th, on it, is turning up the Black Friday sale to 11. Stock up 25% off supplements, including Alpha Brain, 30% off apparel and gear, door buster deals like 50% off the Werewolf Legend Kettlebell, and even exclusive new products like the NCT oils and vitamin D sprays. If you're already a fan on it like I am, you know me, dog. Between the Shroom Tech, the Shroom Tech Sport, 
and the fucking uh, the, 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 the chocolate had fourth protein. That's what I live by. It's a time to stock up like a prepper for the winter. It's like stocking up with the edibles now. Lee's got a good idea, but he's a half a fan. <laughs> if you're curious about it, check out what they have to offer and just give something a try. Honor doesn't mess around. You will not be disappointed. So do me a favor. Head to Onnit.com, Black Friday, and sign up for alerts. Again, that's Onnit.com, Black Friday, to take advantage of the biggest deals of the year. That's Onnit.com slash Black Friday. Go to Onnit.com. Don't forget to always press in church and tell them your Uncle Joey sent you. Number two, listen, everybody needs some fucking Gitas. Everybody's looking to make a dollar. Now, who the fuck are you kidding? Who wants to show up on Thanksgiving with bunny rabbit fucking pockets with a story? You're not going to believe it. I went out last night. I got pickpocketed. No, you're a fucking mook. That's what happens. But you got a skill. You're an idiot savant. You know how to pick a game every week. You're smart. You're not like the other suckers that are picking 18 games. You know how to get a game and load up like a motherfucker. You understand me? Because you can feel in your bones that it's going to come in. And even though you got $8 in your pocket and whatever's in your piggy bank, Columbus took a chance. So are you. You blast that fucking book for a thousand fucking dollars. And there you are, that the Friday after Thanksgiving, getting your dick sucked and your balls licked. I can make that happen. You know why? Mybookie.ag. Listen, you need it, and I know where you get it. My bookie is the place to score serious cash on your scorch predictions. Listen, you're good at what the fuck you do. You know it, and I know it. Believe it or not, the holidays are just around the corner, and that's big eaters. Big money I ever made was December selling sports information. Why? Because you got the bowl games. You got college basketball. You got pro basketball. You got pro football. You got fucking pro football playoffs. Listen. It's like going to the bank ATM machine every fucking day. And that's what it's all about. And while this means plenty of parties, gifts, freaks, spending, you hang out with fucking, you know. It also means there's a lot of football, basketball, hockey games. And like I said, you can score big every day. Man up and play like the pros on game day. You can play the money line, side or total. My bookie is your hookup for all your betting needs and offers super fast payouts when you win. Bam, bam, boom. Where you bet is just as important as who you're betting on. And if you want more money betting on games, you got to go with mybookie.ag. They're the only site I'd recommend. I trust them, but you don't have to take my word for it. Check them out yourself. They have odds on every matchup and a mobile site that makes wagering on your smartphone a breeze, Jack. I'm going to tell you what Uncle Joey's going to do for you out of respect for the Indians and the Pilgrims. Join now, and my bookie will match your deposit with up to a 50% bonus. I got to take, take a sip of water because I might faint from that mm. fucking deal. That's a great bonus. Again, join now, and my bookie will match your deposit with a 50% bonus. Use promo code CHURCH to activate the offer and get the party started. Freaks, limos, you know what I'm saying? You'll be calling your ex-girlfriend saying, listen to this chick snorting the line off my Uranus. <laughs> Visit my bookie AG. Use promo code CHURCH today. You play, you win, you get paid. You understand me? And that's the name of the day. It's getting paid. You could be walking around like Mayweather. So go to mybookie.ag. Promo code church. Number three, you're a fat fuck. You're thinking of joining your jitsu. You hit me on the fucking church pod, uh Gmail site. You're too embarrassed to hit me on the church website. You can say, Joe, you're a fat fuck. Where'd you get your geese? Fujisports.com. That's where I got my gee. First gee I ever got from them, I borrowed it. A friend of mine said, try this on. I don't know what it was, but it fit like a glove. I went home and ordered a size bigger, the Superado. Super Urado, something like that. Tremendous. I ordered the Seiko. S-E-I-K-O. But the Superado is my fucking favorite of all time. I'm a big guy. People hang on my neck. They tug. They pull. Tip-top Magoo. The collar still looks brand fucking new. What I'm going to do for you 
for Black Friday. Forget 10%, I'm slashing it. 15%. Go to Fujisports.com right now. Look at the great apparel they got, whether it's the rash guards, the new elemental gi is tremendous also. It's white and blue. The blue one is badass. And also look at like that navy blue purple one. It's like 99 bucks with the Fuji on the side. Oh, shit. You'll be looking sharp at your next jiu-jitsu class. And you're feeling good. It's light. It's tougher than death. Go to Fujisports.com right now. Again, I want to thank my man, Lee Sayat. I want to thank my man, Be Real. And I want to let you guys know December 3rd, the Nova Theater with my man, Wheeler Walker. December 4th, San Diego, the Observatory. Again, I'm opening for Wheeler. 20 bucks, people. And Tuesday, the 5th, I'm opening up for Wheeler again at the, the Observatory in Santa Ana. Lee Sayat will be giving there all three nights signing autographs and taking pictures and whatnot. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. I love you motherfuckers with all my heart. Stay black, stay healthy, be careful, and have a great weekend. Love you.